what, what is the root issue for that hatred towards our black brothers and sisters? The Lord woke me up kind of in the middle of the night and he answered that question. And, and the answer was, because they're my chosen people. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son Titus put an end to Jerusalem with great slaughter. Many outrages and atrocities were committed against the remainder of the people. It has been estimated that over one million Hebrews fled into the interiors of Africa from Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Hebrew slaves. To reconnect to your history, you need to do three things. One, you need to redefine who the children of Judah are according to the old references. Not from the 1900s to newer, because those books tend to have a totally, completely different history in those books. So you have to ask yourself, how did we lose this in history? How did you lose 400,000 people in history? And the reason why I say how did you lose 400,000 people in history is not in the books. Many people in today's time, many Israelites who don't know their heritage or who they are, are looking back. Now it is up to us to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Hi, Shalom Shalom from Israel. This is Ola, the daughter of Jethro. And I just heard that you black people that were stolen from Africa to America, that you don't know who you are. But you are the children of, of Yahweh, the children of Israel. And I'm telling you, you have to come back to your homeland, here to Zion, to Jerusalem. Hello, everybody. This video is to show you who the true Hebrews or Jews are. Your true Jews or your true Yehud are the so-called black person. I know the black people here are the true Hebrew Israelites. And I'd like to now bring up another interesting place that you find the descendants of the Israelites, but may not necessarily be from the Ten Tribes, but will also play a role. And shouldn't be overlooked. It's a very serious scenario. This is in Africa. Africa has perhaps hundreds of millions of people with this identity right now of being from the people of Israel. When the Romans conquered Judea a few hundred years after that the tribes of Israel went into exile, perhaps millions of Judeans were sold into slavery, into Africa, into Rome, deep into Africa. And if you look now, you're seeing people who are most likely the descendants of those slaves. I just wanted to come to you to uh, impart some knowledge on to you about who the true Biblical Hebrew Israelites are. Um, Bloodline-wise, they are the so-called African Americans. The wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha in the fifth chapter talks about how Jacob, uh, how the heathen is going to be amazed and confounded when they realized that that so-called black man is uh, that chosen line. Now if I were to tell you that blacks for as many centuries as whites have been uh, superior if you want in the western world that for just as many centuries blacks were superior you'd probably find that hard to believe and you wonder how such a fact could be hidden and the answer is again collusion the whites wouldn't want to admit such a thing because whites like to feel superior and like to think that their superiority is somehow permanent, decreed by God. As for blacks, if you look into the black civilizations that we're going to take a look at momentarily, you find something pretty interesting. You find that those civilizations actually arose as Jewish civilizations, later to become... From West Africa, they have been taken as a slaves to America. Brothers and sisters, blacks of America, it's you. You are the true Hebrews. You are the true Hebrews from the Bible. America gonna be, do everything, gonna invest as much money as it has, 
uh, gonna fight as much wars as they as they can. Gonna invite as much weapons as they can, just to hide this away from you. Gonna take Israel. Gonna bring white people here and to tell you these are the Jews. Gonna do. Gonna kill you. Gonna kill Arabs. Gonna mistreat white people like this guy, just to tell you this lie. That that you are nobody and we are the Jews with all the history and so on. It has been deleted your history, you don't know who you are, don't forget about it. This is why, because America has been taking your history away, never to find out that it's all about you. I'm telling you this, please, I don't know, I don't ask you to come to Israel and to start a revolution, I'm just try, asking you to start thinking this way, to believe me a little bit, because I'm living in Israel and I'm part of this. Uh, injustice. I really believe that people like me and you, we can we can bring the justice. Because as the Gentiles, we do need you. We need you to come and pray because you are our savior. You the one that was chosen by Yahweh to live in this land, not the Jewish people. It's you. You were stolen from Africa. They deceived you. They told you that you are slaves, but you actually the children of Israel. And it's time just to come. Come back, come for, for your people, come back for us, come back for the whole Gentiles because only you, only you gonna save us. So please come back to that. First of all, we do know that the ones who were caught were sold into slavery and shipped to Europe and Asia. But no Hebrews fled to Europe and Asia. How do we know this? Number one, the Roman soldiers. In order for the Hebrews to flee into Asia and Europe, they would have to go north, directly into the teeth of the Roman Empire. Remember, Syria was controlled by Rome and their armies fought for Rome. Syrian province forces were directly engaged in the Great Jewish Revolt of 66 to 70 AD. In 66 AD, Celsius Gallus, the legate of Syria, brought the Assyrian army, reinforced by auxiliary troops, to restore order in Judea and quell the revolt. The legion, however, was ambushed and destroyed by Jewish rebels at the Battle of Bethphoron. As a result, that shocked the Roman leadership. The future emperor Vespasian was put in charge of subduing the Jewish revolt. In the summer of 69, Vespasian with the Syrian Union supporting him, launched his bid to become Roman Emperor. He defeated this rival, Vitellius, and ruled as Emperor for 10 years when he was succeeded by his son Titus. So if the Romans controlled Jerusalem and Syria, how could they flee north? Or better yet, why would they when the same Romans had no control or military presence south of them in Africa? Why would you flee from your enemies into your enemies' territory? Remember, the only province that Rome had in Africa was far northwest of them, clear across the continent in Tunisia. They could easily escape death by heading south. Also, because they were black Hebrews, if Rome came south into Africa, how could they find them or how could they be able to distinguish the Hebrew from the Hamite? Seeing through all scripture, that was a problem, even amongst black people. Number two, fleeing to Africa was something that the Hebrews always did. When it was prophesied that Judah was going to be taken into captivity, what did the Hebrews do? Jeremiah 26, verse 18 and 21. Micah the Moorshite prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 
and spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion should be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountains of the house of the high places of forest. And when Jehoiakim the king, with all his mighty men and the princes, heard the words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard it, he was afraid, and he fled and went into Egypt. Jeremiah 42, verses 13 through 16. But if ye say, You will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. If you wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt, and go to sojourn there, then it will come to pass that the sword which ye fear shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine, whereof you are afraid, shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there you shall die. One reason the Hebrews will always flee south is because of the long relationships Israel had with Egypt and Cush. Remember, Solomon had relationships with Pharaoh's daughter, Egypt, and the Queen of Sheba, Cush, Arabia. The marriage of a king's daughter to a prince or a king is a sign of a union or partnership between two countries. 1 Kings 3, verse 1. And Solomon made a affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. 2 Chronicles 8, verse 11. And Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David into the house which he had built for her. For he said, My wife should not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy, whereof the ark of the Lord hath come. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 12. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, besides that which she brought up to the king. So she turned and went to her own land, she and her servant. This union with Egypt and Cush was so strong that during the siege of Nebuchadnezzar, Egypt even tried to fight and protect Judah from Babylon. Jeremiah 37, verses 1 and 5 through 7. And King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. Then Pharaoh's army came forth out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans besieged Jerusalem, heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus should you say to the king of Judah, That sent you unto me, inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt in their own land. Now, if Israel had allies who would fight for them, and also there were already Hebrews in Ethiopia and Egypt, plus the Roman garrisons were to the north of them, why would they flee north? Isaiah 11, 11. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover a remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. So we know that the Hebrews were brought to Assyria and to Shinar in the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities. The other locations, Syria, Pathros, and Egypt, which is northern and southern Egypt and Cush. Remember, there were Hebrews in Cush before 70 AD, for one. Also notice how the Most High named Cush along with Egypt. So if the Hebrews were already in Cush, which is East Africa, why would it be a stretch that they would migrate west? Well, one would say, God didn't say that they migrated west. So they didn't live in West Africa. Well, let's take a look and see if the Most High said anything about them being west of Cush. In 3, verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, Cush, my supplants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. And that day shalt thou not be ashamed of all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. But then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride and thou shalt no more be haughty because of thy holy mountain pretty interesting it says that the dispersed of Israel are beyond the rivers of Cush hmm I thought they was only in Europe and in Asia now let's take a closer look at this scripture beyond Eber a region across 
on the opposite side. So let me get this straight. The Most High said that the dispersed of Israel are in the opposite side of the rivers of Cush. Wow. So what's the opposite side of East Africa? Hey, that would be West Africa. Get out of here. Who would have thought? Hey, I wonder if anybody else knew about these Hebrews being in West Africa. In the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son, Titus, put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter. During the period of the military governors of Palestine, many outrages and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing the Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. From Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf R. Windsor. The 16th century historian and traveler, Leon Africanus, was a Hebrew-speaking Jewish convert to Islam, raised in a Jewish household by Jewish parents of Moroccan descent. Leon Africanus traveled extensively in Africa south of the Sahara, where he encountered innumerable black African Jewish communities. Let me say it again, where he encountered innumerable black African Jewish communities. Leon later converted to Catholicism, but remained interested in Jewish communities where he encountered throughout his travels in West Africa. This is a quote from his book, The Description of Africa. Albeit, they say that upon the Nihilus, or the Nile, you will have it two great and populous nations. One of Jews toward the West, under a government of a mighty king. Leo Africanus, The Description of Africa, Volume 1, page 32. Ibn Kulahan, who lived in the 13th century, a respected authority on Berber history, testified that the black Jews of Western Sudan, with whom he personally interacted. Also, the famous Muslim geographer El Drisi, born in Qatar, Spain in the 12th century, wrote extensively about Jewish Negroes in the Western Sudan. Black Jews were fully integrated and achieved preeminence in many West African kingdoms. For instance, the Jews were believed to have settled in great West African empires such as Songhai, Mali, Ghana, and Kanumbarno empires. According to numerous accounts of contemporary visitors to the region, several rulers and administrators of the Songhai Empire were of Jewish origins until Askia Muhammad came to power in 1492 and decreed that all Jews either convert to Islam or leave the region. Some accounts place some West African Jewish community in the Ondo Forest of Nigeria, south of Timbuktu. This community maintained a Torah scroll as late as in the 1930s, written in Aramaic, that had been burnt into a parchment with a hot iron instead of ink, so it could not be changed. See, going Rafika, the quest of the lost ten tribes of Israel to the ends of the earth. This quote is from The Travels of Ludovico di Farmita in Egypt, Syria, Arabia Desert, and Arabia Felix in Persia, India, and Ethiopia AD 1503-1508 At the end of eight days, we found a mountain which appeared to be 10 or 12 miles in circumference in which mountain there dwell four or five thousand Jews who go naked and are in height five or six spans and have a feminine voice and are more black than any other color they live entirely on the flesh of sheep and eat nothing else they are circumcised and confess that they are Jew these quotes are from the earth and its inhabitants the universal geography by Alice Rakulis the Mandingans were now broken up into many rival petty states or excellent husbandmen but display their remarkable talents chiefly as traders they have been compared to the Sirocles the Jews of West Africa this quote is from Ebu's Hebrew Exiles from Israel, Amazing Facts and Revelations. The first British explorers who met the Ebu's of Nigeria were quick to identify them as a branch of Hebrews, based 1938, and so simply referred to them as Hebrews, Hebos, Ebos, and later Ebu's. But during the time of the first documentation of the history of the Ebu's, the early Ebu's, who knew very little or no English, Following the pronunciation of the new version of their original name by their colonial masters, deviated from the name Ivite Agluri, from Ivert, Ifite, or Ihite, 
and began to use the popular new and foreign language of the colonialists, and so referred to themselves as Hebo, a corruption of Hebrew, or an accepted to be called Hebo, Ebo or Ebu, as a way of associating themselves with the emergent new culture of their colonial master. Ebos, Hebrew exiles from Israel. Amazing facts and revelations. Chapter 7, Jewish origin of the Ebus. Perspectives from history and divine revelation. Before the British dubbed the Ebus as Hebus and later Ebus, their original name that they called themselves was Ivrit. Why is this important? Because the word Hebrew is actually not Hebrew, but an English word for the descendants of Abraham. The true pronunciation is Ivri. It's estimated that over 60% of African Americans have at least one Igbo ancestor. The Igbos are among the largest segment of Hebrews. Dr. Professor Alfred Bidenheimer attested this true. British rabbis were already aware in the 1840s that there might be descendants of the 10 tribes in the Niger Delta. That is even before the process of Jewish acceptance of better Israel or the Ethiopian Jews began. Evidently, though the Ibus, who today number about 20 to 30 million people, would be political and demographic dynamite given the sheer number of potential Jews in Nigeria. It is no accident to see the Israeli authorities are hesitant to act, even as non-Orthodox rabbis from the U.S. are undertaking full-scale missionary tours among the Ibu. Many rabbis attest to the Hebrew heritage of the Ibu, including activist Rabbi Brant Rosen. This is from his article on the Ibu, Teshuva, and the resiliency of the Jewish spirit. After participating in a congregational delegation to Africa this past spring, I had found profound desire to spend a longer period of time there on my summer sabbatical. As I searched for the best possible way to serve as a volunteer rabbi, I found my way to Kulanu, who informed me they had been long interested in sending a volunteer rabbi to Nigeria. Upon further conversation, I received an extensive education on the Ibu tribe, a large Nigerian tribe of 40 million, whose clans traced their lineage to the lost tribes of Israel. For many years, both Ibu and Western scholars have noted the striking similarities between the native Ibu customs and the Israelite tradition. Today, the Ibu are most entirely Christian, having been throughout missionized by the British, but they nonetheless retain a strong sense of kinship with the Jewish people. Over the last decade or so, an astonishing phenomenon has developed, a Jewish rebirth of sorts occurring throughout the Ibu community. Synagogues have been forming spontaneously throughout Nigeria, along with attending the growth of Hebrew and Torah study. As I am continuing to realize, much of the traditional Jewish self-image has been marked by a decidedly white Eurocentric bias. When the Moravian church missionaries came to the West Indies and encountered the Ibu slaves, they gave an interesting account. Here are some of their quotes. Whereas the Ibus do not tolerate one uncircumcised slave among them. Only when he is circumcised do they accept him in as worthy of human company. This is one of the most least known facts among the slave trade. See, there was more circumcised slaves than there were slave owners. And remember, the slave traders were Ashkenazi Jews. So even today when we look at the numbers as far as how many people are circumcised globally, the more people per capita circumcised in Nigeria than there are in Israel or the United States. And what is circumcision? Circumcision is the sign of the covenant that the Most High gave to Abraham and his seed. Among the Ebus, they, the priests, are taking out a sort of people whom they call living sacrifices. These very ones live celibate and without property and at the expense of others and have the liberty to take from the others all of what they need and nobody hinders them. Like the Pharisee among the Jews, they let their hair grow and the use of scissors is not permitted to them.
One of the most well-documented Ibus was a young man by the name of Ola Uda Equiano. Bought books, amen, and just was looking over, and the dude is amazing. I want to introduce you to a fella by the name of Ola Uda Equiano. Ola Uda Equiano, amen. And I'm going to show you a picture of him, amen. Ola Uda Equiano lived in the 1700s. He was born in 1745, amen. He was born in Africa, West Africa, amen. Uh, uh, actually, he lived near the desert of Seth. Ooh, and there shouldn't be a desert of Seth in Africa where people are not supposed to know their Bible. But let's continue to go deep, all right? Because Seth was the son of Adam after Abel and Cain went through their thing, amen? You don't name no desert the desert of Seth if you don't know your Bible, all right? And it was named that before the Europeans came. But let's go deeper. Raised in this area near the desert of Seth, amen? He was from the Ebu people, Ebu people. He was an Ebu. All right, 1745 from southern Nigeria. One day, amen, he was from a wealthy family of the Ibu people. One day, he's with his sister, amen, mom and daddy going to work and stuff like that, doing their thing. Listen, uh, uh, Negro land was more civilized than a lot of people give us credit for, amen. Some people jumped over the wall in a village, amen, and kidnapped uh, uh, Ola, Ola Uda and his sister sold them into slavery all right they cross africa they walk across africa and everything like that he's moving from people to people finally they sell him to european slave traders he you should read i'm gonna get to it but when you read his own writing he writes about his adventures all right he he comes to the waters of the atlantic and he sees a slave ship for the first time and he's like what is that fortress sitting on the water but his, 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 his autobiography says he was amazed by it, but when he stepped on the ship, he realized, amen, that he was in a most cursed situation, that he was about to lose his life. When they took him under the, the deck of the ship, you see, and he saw all of his people packed in like sardines, laying in their own excrement and mess, he said a smell almost killed him. Now he's 11 year old at this time, all right? They bring him to the Caribbean, which was the slave, uh, slave, uh, transatlantic slave trade. Bring him over there. He said the atrocities that he witnessed, he mark them out all in his book. He actually has a book, y'all. All right? All right? So, so he, he, he illustrates all of the atrocities. All right? He gets to America. Hallelujah. He, he learns the, the semen trade. He becomes a, sea, a semen. They used to call them blackjacks uh, uh, when, when people uh, from Africa became great semen. And he was very smart, very astute. Amen. He began to learn how to read. Amen. He was sold to an Englishman and the Englishman was taking care of him. And, and he said the first time he heard the Bible and began to hear about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And began to hear about the laws of Moses. He, it arrested him. And he said, wait up. He said, most of that sound like the practices of my people. Ooh. Hey, read his book. Read his book. He said, most of that sound like the practices of my people. You see what I'm saying? Well, what, 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 what did he say? He said, well, just like the Hebrews of the Bible, he said, we have one true God. We worship him. He is the creator of all things. And when we did a study on his language, they call him a name. And when you, when you do the etymology of the name that the Hebrews called him, that, that, that Ola Uda called him, they didn't just call him God. They called him the God of Abraham. Somebody got to hear me up in here. Somebody, listen, listen. If you was waiting for something, this right here is what we would call in the courtroom the smoking gun right here. This is the, this is the best evidence that I can give you, this Ola Uda. You'll never hear him in school because they don't want you to know about him. All right? All right? This is the smoking gun feeling. You know what I'm saying? Listen to me. Now listen to me. We saw in the scriptures, but we're giving you physical evidence. Hola, Uda. All right? They not only worship the one true God that they called the God of Abraham. Amen. But the interesting thing is, is that the Ebus also practice circumcision on the eighth day. On the eighth day. 
They waited until the eighth day. Now, now to be circumcised in Africa is a mystery altogether itself. People that never heard of God in the Bible be circumcised. You know? Well, Pastor, what is circumcision? Circumcision is the sign of the covenant. Oh, God have mercy. Meaning that God would show who his covenant people would be by a sign. And that sign would be the sign of circumcision. And, and my little wife, amen, she's so astute and, and researching and she found, amen, hallelujah. Go, go look up circumcision and, and, and what part of the world has the most circumcised people. And it's all of West Africa. More circumcised people than the United States, Europe, amen, all over the world. The sign of the covenant. Olaura, he says people were circumcised on the eighth day. Do your research. Most of the slaves that came in were circumcised. You, 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 you don't know. You don't know. It's the sign of the covenant. More slaves were circumcised than slave owners. And white folk that was here in America. The sign of the covenant. Ola Uda not only said that. He said that we practice just like the law of Leviticus. The laws of purity, cleanliness, and uncleanness. We can't touch a dead body. There's some things that we could eat and that we can't eat. Ooh, things that's kosher and not kosher. You, are you hearing me up in here? He was reading, he said, that's us. Ola Uda, this is 1745, Brian. He said they practice animal sacrifices to atone for their sins. He, he said they practice the feast according to the law of Moses. Uh, one of the weirdest things was that just like a woman before she got married had to provide a, the man had to provide a dowry. They did the same thing as the, the list go on and on. We can look at Ola Uda's name and see where he's from. Da Uda, Da Uda means Judah. Da Uda means Judah. His parents was naming him and saying what tribe he was from. And when you read this young man's narrative, he would always say that it was the most high that was keeping him alive. And I know why the most high was keeping him alive. Because though he's dead now, yet he's speaking. They made him, hallelujah. He was the first black autobiographer. 1745 wrote all about his life. Earned so much money as a seaman, he went to his master, put the money on the table and said, I want to buy myself back. You understand what I'm saying? Ola Uda bought himself back at 20 years old. After he bought himself back, amen, he started, amen, a career as an abolitionist to try to abolish slavery in Europe. He was in England and London, amen, at the time. While in England and London, he writes his book, his masterpiece, his autobiography, the interesting life, the narrative of Ola Uda. And this is where we get so much information about his past and about his people, which you have to realize that his people are our people. There are many other witnesses to the evil, like journalist Mark Perlman of the Jewish Daily Forward, which in his 2008 article wrote, there is a real phenomenon of a construction of a Jewish identity in sub-Saharan Africa over the last few decades, said Edith Bruder, a French researcher who recently published The Black Jews of Africa, History, Religion, Identity by Oxford University Press. The Nigerian Jewish claim has been bolstered several years ago with the discovery in the area of an onyx stone reportedly bearing the name Gad in ancient Hebrew. Then there's the question of the British West African flag and currency. In the 19th century, the pound sterling became the currency of the British West African territories. In standard issue, United Kingdom coinage circulated in Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Gambia. So why was the so-called Star of David found on the flag and currency of West Africa? Well, the explanation of the emblem can be found in one of the 1949 editions of the magazine called Nigeria, which had an extract 
from a letter written on April 1940 by Lord Lagarde. It reads, The design of interlaced triangles, I think is commonly called Solomon's seal. I don't know it, and when it was adopted as the seal of Islam, but it was found on the lid of a very handsome goblet or jug of brass and copper covered with designs, which was captured by the troops when the Emir of Kantoga, the principal slave trader in northern Nigeria, was defeated. Why would that symbol be found on ancient artifacts in Nigeria, you ask? The areas of Mali, Ghana, Niger, and Nigeria, better known as Negro Land or the Western Sudan, where the Ibus reside, is a historical Hebrew epicenter. The following quote is from Babylon to Timbuktu by Dr. Rudolf R. Windsor. Philip St. Laurent, who writes a monthly article on African history, see Tuesday Magazine, for Philadelphia Bulletin, says that the soldiers of Mali, West Africa, were made prisoner of the ruling family of Daya Sobi. This was the Zai Hebrew dynasty. Among these prisoners were Ali Kolon or Kilan and his brother Selmar Nar, the sons of Zai Yisbi. These Hebrew princes were appointed as pages at the court of Mali about 1335 AD. In the meantime, Gao was subjected under the Mali political system, says Davison. And Mansa Kakan Musa extracted tribute from its rulers. It was not too long before the princes of the Zai dynasty escaped from the court of Mali. They organized the army and fought against the king of Mali. Ali Kolon entertained a profound hatred against the Mali conquerors because they had subjected his people. In the later part of the 14th century, the army of Ali Kolon, later called Sunni, the liberator Ali, made attacks on Nani, the capital of Mali. Yearning for independence, Sani Ali detested in paying tribute to Mali because of the exploits of Sani Ali. The Zai dynasty of Gao acquired a new appellation. The dynasty after Sani Ali, the first is called the Sani or Shai dynasty. There were about 17 or 18 Islamic Hebrew kings in this dynasty. From 90 AD to 1492, not only did the Hebrews reside in West Africa, but they built dynasties and empires. The Mali, the Zai, the Shai, the Songhe, the Ashanti empires ruled until the Muhammadan invasion. And the last empire of Ghana was disbanded by Askia Muhammad in 1492. This is why when Europeans like Lord Lagarde, when finding the Seal of Solomon on West African artifacts, were making statements like, the design of the interlaced triangles is I think commonly called Solomon's seal. I don't know how it and when it was adopted as the seal of Islam. Solomon's seal is not the seal of Islam, but because of the Islamic takeover of a Hebrew people, symbols such as the so-called seal of Solomon and others were discovered throughout West Africa. Even late prime minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, before he was assassinated in 1995, sent a team to Nigeria in search for the lost 10 tribes of Israel. And if that doesn't quite convince you, this video from September 6, 2006, when the chief rabbi of the Sanhedrin in Israel officially recognized the Igbo people as the lost tribes of Israel after receiving a letter from the Igbo rabbi, Habin Daniel. Oh, 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 oh,
Then there's a little matter of the islands of West Africa, in particular St. Tome, which became an unwilling destination for a particular group of people. During the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, over a million Hebrews fled south through Egypt into Ethiopia, until eventually migrating and settling on the west coast. The ones who could not escape were captured by the Romans and sold into Europe as slaves in Spain and in Portugal. Lots of their remain until the Inquisitions into the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella, when they gave an edict that all Jews were expelled from the country. These are the Jews who the so-called Sephardic Jews are supposed to descend from. But before you think about Jerry Seinfeld, let's see what history has to say about the Jews of Spain. When the Jews were expelled from Spain, thousands fled to North and Western African countries. About 100,000 entered Portugal, where they were permitted to enter under the condition that they would pay a poll tax, with the understanding that they would leave the country in eight months. Also at this time, the king obligated himself to take the Jews wheresoever they desired at the termination of the eight months. When the time expired, many Jews were stranded because the king did not provide enough ships in time. All the black Jews who were left behind were deprived of their freedom and sold into slavery. During the reign of King Zhao II or John II, 700 black Hebrew children were ruthlessly taken from their parents in Portugal and transported to the island of St. Tome off the west coast of Africa. This island is near Nigeria, Cameroon, and Gabon. Dr. Alan H. Godby says that the Portuguese founded this island of St. Tome in 1471. In the year of 1484, King John II of Portugal, who reigned from 1481 to 1495, offered the Jews of his kingdom the choice of baptism or settling at St. Tome. Multitudes of Jews were sent to this island during the reign of John II. In the year A.D. 1492, January 2nd, the Moorish stronghold of Granada surrendered to the armies of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. For the first time since the year 711, all of Spain was in Christian hands. The decree to expel the Jews from Spain was signed on March 31st in one of the corridors of the Great Alhambra, the palace of the Moorish kings of Granada. The motive given for the expulsion of the Jews was conceived that they corrupted the Moranos, or Jews converted to Christianity. 
by privately encouraging them in disloyalty to Christianity. So your first question you have to ask yourself is, who are the Moors? Well, let's start with a definition. Moorish, of or relating to the Moors, a Muslim people of Northwest Africa. Oh, interesting. So didn't we learn that many of the Hebrew tribes of West Africa converted to Islam? So what did the Moors look like by chance? Deuteronomy 28 verse 36 And the Lord shall bring thee And thy king which thou set over thee Unto a nation where neither thou Nor thy fathers have known And there thou shalt serve other gods Wood and stone Wood and cross representing Catholicism And the Kaaba stone representing Islam now the edict to expel the Jews was because when the white European rulership took over Spain, i.e. Ferdinand and Isabella, they said that the Jews were corrupting the Moranos, who were the Jews converted to Christianity. So who were the Moranos? Well, let's take a look at the two words more and Morano. And at first look, you'll see that the word more is the root word for the word Morano. So what's the etymology behind the word more? Or in other words, what does it mean? The origin of the English term more is the Greek marvo, which literally translated means black, blackened, or charred. The word morano comes from the word moreno and moron. Moreno means someone who has brown or dark skin. Maron means brown color. But in slang, Spanish moron is also a very popular word meaning bad situation. Here are a couple of Moran images. The word Moran is also written Maroon. Possibly the word Maroon is Seminole share the same origin in the Latin word maroon, in Greek meaning black or dark skin. But we'll save the Native American topic for another documentary. So if you haven't connected the dots yet, the word moron is also taken from the word maroon. This is why racist pseudoscience like Drectomania existed in America during slavery. Drectomania was a conjectural mental illness that in 1851 American physician Samuel A. Cartwright hypothesized to cause black slaves to want to flee captivity. So in other words, you are a moron or mentally disabled for not wanting to remain a slave. But let's continue. This is the reason why maroon also means bad situation in Spanish. Because the word maroon became the international term for runaway blacks who escaped slavery. As we see, the word morano means black or brown. So the term Morano Jew translates as Black Jew. There are reports that Columbus and others were Moranos, but they were not. But rather crypto Jews, European Catholics who secretly practiced Judaism. King Ferdinand was worried that the converted Moranos would be influenced by the Orthodox Hebrews and Moors, which both converts to both Judaism and Islam were referred to by an even broader term called New Christians. The black Jews went to Portuguese colonial possessions in Western Africa, which were Guina, Santome Island, Senegal, Angola, and a few islands near the African coast. Throughout the persecutions in Portugal, thousands of Jews left the country. The Jews were leaving the country in such massive numbers that in 1499 and in 1531, the king published a law forbidding the new Christians, black Jews, from leaving Portugal without special permits. Caesar Rock wrote that the Christian Jews immigrating from the Portuguese colony of Angola in West Africa were agents of the Inquisition and were sent there to ferry them out in 1626. It is certain that many black Jews of Portugal, Santome Island, and Angola who became victims of the Inquisition and Portuguese persecution were sold into the slave trade. 
It's the Untold Story Revised Edition by Edgar Shaw. The expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal. So just in case you had any question about the Murano Jews or the quote-unquote new Christians, here are some pictures of the Christian converts in Portugal. So let's get some accounts of what the Hebrews of Spain or the Sephardics actually look like. RHM Elves gives a graphic description of the Portuguese Jew. Baruch Spinoza, middle size, good features, skin somewhat black, black curly hair, long eyebrows of the same color. So that one might know by his looks that he was the descendant of a Portuguese Jew. Waits, when speaking on the Portuguese Jews, says an interesting gradation of color down to the black is exhibited by the Jews. Especially dark were the Jews of Spain and Portugal. These Portuguese Jews were very dark. J.C. Pritchard, the Duchess of Brantes, the wife of Napoleon's ambassador to Portugal, said this about the Portuguese Jews. The Jew, the Negro, and the Portuguese can be seen in a single person. Nature knows no color line. John Bigelow, who visited Jamaica in the 1850s, saw the enslaved Jews of Spain, or the Sephardic Jews, and witnessed that they were Negroid. Nature knows no color line, pages 123 and 130. The term Moor or Murano was a blanket term for the Israelites meaning black who were taken to the areas of Spain, Portugal, Germany, England and Rome by the Romans in 70 AD as slaves. But when the Roman Empire fell, these Hebrews took control and ruled those areas and remained there until the European powers took back over, like in 1492. This is how you get terms like Anglo-Saxon, which translates as the angelic sons of Isaac or the German name Kop, which is derived from the Hebrew Yaakov via the Latin Jacobus. The name was changed throughout the major European languages from Jacques, Giovaco, Giacapo, Iacapo to Kop. Hence names in German like Schwarzkop. Schwartz is a surname of the German origin meaning black. So names like Schwarzkop translate as Black Jacob or Schwarzenegger which translates as Black Negro from the Dutch Neger. In Austria, it translates as Black Plowman, give you a picture of a servant or a slave. Speaking of Austria, Ferdinand I ruled the Austrian hereditary lands of Habsburg in the name of his elder brother Charles V, who was a Holy Roman Emperor from 1527 to 58. As you see in these images, him and his son Maximilian upon their royal currency that they were Negroid peoples. Then there's the famous King James, hence the King James Bible. The question I have to ask you is, who is this guy? When the Scotland Historical Society admits that King James is a black man, so where does the English word James come from? Once again, from the Greek Iacopo to the great size Jacobus and Jacques or the German shortened cop. Then there's the issue of his son, Charles Stewart. The word Stewart comes from the old Nordish root Svart, which means black. Stewart is the same word as Swarthy or Schwartz, which means black in Old English. It was said that when Charles was born in 1630, he was nicknamed the Black Boy by his mother, Queen Henrietta Maria, 
because of its dark and swarthy appearance, as you can see in this true image and not the whitewashed imposter. He is commemorated in the celebrated name of the Black Boy Inn found all over the British Isle. As far as the term Saxon goes, it actually has Israelite ties that go back even to the Northern Kingdom in the Assyrian captivity. Amos 7, verse 16. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. The house of Isaac is a little known title used to describe Israelites. To get a clearer picture on the term Saxon, let's read some excerpts from Our Race, Its Origin and Destiny, a series of studies on the Saxon riddle by Charles A. L. Tolton. M.A. The Saxons did not go to Germany to obtain their name. They were called Saxons and Scythians centuries before the first European German was heard of. Herodotus says the Persians call all the Scythians Sakai, Sai, and Scythopolis has been traced to Skytopolis, or the city of Sikuth, a corruption of Sikuth or Sakoth the city of the Scots, Sites, Sax, or Wanderers, i.e. dwellers in booths. So it was the Medo-Persians who coined the term Sack, which is derived from Isaac or Isaac. It was also the Persians who had the sons of Isaac in their possession. Wanderers and dwellers in booths are both prophecies about the Israelites. Hosea 9 Verse 16 through 17. Ephraim is smitten, the root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit, yea. Though they bring forth, yet I will slay, even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away, because they not hearken unto him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. With regard to the etymology of the word Saxon, Yetman finally says its history is as follows. The Persians used the term Sakai and Scythian as convertible, whether from the corrupt rendering of one from the other or because the Sakai, a great tribe of Scythians bordering upon them, were so called by a tribal name. A great question which the Persian scholars must determine. Of the fact that the identity of the Sakai and the Scythians, there is not the shadow of a doubt, and it is clear that these people called their country Sakasina. It is equally clear that the Saxons of England were the Scythians or the Celtians. Their geographical position in Europe is accurately described by Plutarch, Tacticus, Ptolemy, and other authors. Finally, this argument as the Celts are the Celts or the Cumri of all historians of our day, and their origin Sacasina, or as they are the Beth Kimri or the House of Kimri, whom Shalmaneser put into media. And these were the lost ten tribes, whom the biblical historian sent out of Samaria for Baal Qumran worship. It follows that these Scythians as Saxons are none other than a people no longer called in Israel's name, but by the elder name of Isaac, as the Lord ordained. In most Eastern languages, sons of is written Sunia. It is the equivalent of the Scottish Mac or the English or Irish Fitz. So in the distant home of our ancestors, Saxonia meant sons of Sac or sons of Isaac. Dr. W. Holt Yates accepts this derivation of the Saxon name as a positive. And the Rev. W. H. Poole D.D. says in connection with it as follows. It's a little curious to glean from the ancient nations and from the stone monuments of early times the various forms in which this word is to be found. I will here insert a few from a list of my own gleaned from ancient history. Thus, sons of Isaac, sons of Sac, Saxunia, Saxuna, Saxina, Sacapina, Isaxa, or Isaka, which is the name of the town Ola Uda Equiana grew up in in Ibu land, Nigeria. Sakai Emri, Beth Sakai, Sunia Sakai, Sakasuna, Sakasuna, Saxon, Saxon, Saxony, and Saxon. From the Asiatic researchers, Dr. Moore quotes in his book, The Saxons of the East and of the West 
were interested to learn that the White Island in the West, or England, was in India denominated or called Sakana from the Sakas or Saks who conquered that land. What connection did the sons of Isaac have with Persia and India, you ask? Esther 8 verse 9. Then the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month of Savan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and unto the lieutenants, and to the deputies, and the rulers, and the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, a hundred and twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language and to the Jews according to their writing and according to their language so where were the Hebrews or the sons of Isaac Sachs sons under the Persian Empire from the 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia until the fall of the empire when they became wanderers or nomadic peoples among the nations Hosea 9:17. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken to them, and they should be wanderers among the nations. Not only in England, when you look around at the original family crest in Europe in general, you see black people, usually with a bandana on the head. Where did this practice come from? You guessed it. Exodus 28 and 40. You shall make coats for Aaron's sons, and you shall make sashes for them, and you shall make headbands for them, for glory and for beauty. Web and IV. And that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, and their calls or head wraps, and their tires like the moon or hoop earrings, the chains and the bracelets, and the mufflers, which are veils. The bonnets and the ornaments of the leg and the hairbands and the tablets and the earring. So as we see in the scripture, the hairbands and bonnets are part of the Hebrew traditional garb for the males and females. Just as we see in this wall stele made by the Assyrians of the tribe of Judah. This tradition was carried over originally with the ones who were carried away into slavery in the Europe by the Romans in 70 AD. But there is a location today where people still wear that type of garb. Drum roll, please. West Africa. All these types of dress written in scripture are still practiced there to this day in Ghana, Nigeria, Angola, etc. And I do mean all. The tinkling ornaments worn around their feet calls or head wraps, the round tires like the moon or hoop earrings, the chains, the bracelets and the mufflers or veils, bonnets, the ornaments of the leg, the headbands, the nose jewels, even the tablets. There is no other area in the world with that combination of things are war. So even the Jews of Spain ended up in West Africa, only to be funneled back through the transatlantic slave trade. So this begs the question, who in the world are these people claim to be Sephardic Jews? This quote is from African History in Documents, Volume 1. Western African History by Robert O. Collins. The inhabitants of Bonnie when I also last visited at port, I counted to about 3,000. They were a mixture of Igbo or Hebo in the brass tribes. The Igbos, who are also from a neighboring country, have already been spoken of as a superior race. The king of New Calabar and the neighborhood and Pepple, king of Bonnie, were both of Igbo descent, of which also are a mass of the natives. And the number of the slaves from the Igbo country, which throughout the existence of Bani, amounted to perhaps three-fourths of the whole export. It is calculated no fewer than 16,000 of these people alone were annually exported from Bani within the 20 years ending in 1820. 
So that including 50,000 would take it within the same period from new and old Calabar. The aggregate export of the Ebo alone was not short of 370,000. Anglican missionary GT Bastard was so sure of the Ebo's were of Israel, he told other missionaries to familiarize themselves with the Old Testament law so as to better witness to the Ebo, because the Ebo lived like the ancient Israelites. This is a quote from GT Bastard's book, Among the Ebo's of Nigeria. The Ebo country lies within the recognized Negro Belt, and the people there bear the main characteristics of that stock. There are certain customs which rather point to a Levitic influence at a more or less remote period. This is suggested in the underlying ideas concerning sacrifice and in the practice of circumcision. The language also bears several interesting parallels with Hebrew idioms. So where is Western Sudan? At one point the area of Sudan stretched from East Ethiopia to West Africa. At that time it was not called Sudan but Soyudan, meaning land of Judah. In the latter centuries, this area became known by the slave traders as Negro Land. This is where the use of the term Negro originated. So let's take a look at the definition of the word Negro. Negro, a member of a dark-skinned group of peoples who were originally native to Africa, south of the Sahara. The word Negro was adopted from Spanish and Portuguese and was first recorded in the mid-16th century. Notice it says Sub-Saharan African, but when we look at a map of the territories of the Sons of Ham in Africa, but Kush and Mizraim, they are all Northern African or Northern Saharan areas, just as listed in the Bible. But Sub-Saharan Africa was not inhabited by any of the Sons of Ham, nor mentioned in the scripture, as we see in these maps. So who are these mystery blacks who show up in these areas? Egypt, Ethiopia, and Libya are all mentioned in scriptures as the original nations of Africa. But no mention of Soudan or the Congo, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Chad, etc. That's why the word Negro wasn't adopted until the 16th century. So we see that the territory of Sub-Saharan Africa or the Negro was not the territory of the indigenous peoples of the nations of Africa, Libya, Egypt and Kush, which proves the Zadorian Bible Dictionary's claim. Ham, the youngest son of Noah, probably born about 96 years before the flood, and one of the eight persons to live through the flood, he became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. As we see again, the areas beyond the rivers of Kush, as the scripture says, is where the Hebrews were and are. This is the sub-Saharan areas of Africa, which the term Negro was designated. Even some of the countries, cities, and tribes in those areas are named with Hebrew names. Chad, for instance, Genesis 46 and 10. And the sons of Simeon, Jamul and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanish woman. The word Chad is taken from the word Ohad, the grandson of Simeon. Also in the country of Chad, there are areas such as Gerar, who is the son of Benjamin. Genesis 46 and 21. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela and Becher and Ashbel and Gerah and Naaman and E and Rosh, Mupim and Hupim and Ard, the Salmon region of Chad also. Salma was the son of Caleb. First Chronicles chapter 2 verse 50 through 51. These are the son of Caleb, the son of Hur, the firstborn of Aphrata, Shobal, the father of Kibrajerim, Salma, the father of Bethlehem, Harpath, the father of Beth Greater, or in the country of Senegal, the capital, Dakar, which Dakar was the father of one of the twelve officers who oversaw Israel under Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. And Solomon had twelve officers over all Israel which provided victuals for the king and his household. Each man his month in a year made provisions. And these are their names. The son of Hur in Mount Ephraim, the son of Dekar in Makaz, and in Shabim, and Beth Shemesh, and Elon Hathan, or in Ghana, the Ashanti tribe, which Ashan was the son of Judah. Ashanti meaning the people of Ashan. Joshua. 
chapter 15, verse 1 and 42. This then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families, even to the border of Edom, the wilderness of Zin, southward, the uttermost part of the south coast, Libna and Ether and Ashan. Also because of the dual kingdoms of Cush and Africa and Arabia, the Hebrews who didn't flee to Egypt fled south to Dedan, a province of Cush, eventually settling in Yemen before crossing the Red Sea in the South Africa. Haran, West Africa is an interesting place, especially a little place called the Slave Coast, in which the slave traders called Negro Land. As you can see, the area of the Slave Coast was called Wahida. And if you look right above it, in English are the words Kingdom of Judah. This is the port where the so-called African or Negro American was taken, also to the British Islands, South America, and Europe. This area was called Kingdom of Judah. Well, maybe they just called it that, like a nickname or something. But actual Hebrews didn't live there. Well, let's take a look. This is from Press and Bulletin's magazine. Language doc from the Society of Geography. Wahida, also called Fida, Fuida, Uida, Judah or Judah, is an ancient city frequented since the 16th century by Portuguese slave traders who gave it its name. Its inhabitants were said were Judaic and were viewed as the remnant of the scattered tribes of Israel. This quote is from Creole New Orleans, Race and Americanization by Arnold R. Hirsch and Joseph Logston. Between June 1719 and January 1731, 16 slave trading ships arrived in Louisiana from the Senegal region. Six ships came from Judah, Wida, a slave trading post. Between February 1726 and January 1731, 12 slave ships from Senegal landed. 3,259 slaves at Belize at the mouth of the Mississippi River. During the same period, one ship from Judah landed 464 slaves at the same port. The African slaves brought to the Chesapeake during the 18th century came mainly from the Bright of Bifara and were heavily Igbo. Here's a couple of more quotes from the Earth and its inhabitants, the Universal Geography. East of the Great Popo begins the Dahomey territory, guarded by the important town of Gluia. Known to Europeans by various names, Fida, Havida, Waida, Wida. The old writers called it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be the Jews. During the flourishing days of the slave trade from 16 to 18,000 were annually transported from Ajuda, as the Portuguese called this place, which at that time had a population of 35,000. Part of the local trade is in the hands of the Mavumas, a people of grave and solemn aspect with intelligent eyes, straight or even eloquent nose, whose pronounced Semitic type have earned them the Portuguese designation of Judos Pretos, or Black Jew. I don't know how much more proof you need, but I'm going to give you some more. Who by chance financed and organized these Portuguese slave traders who discovered the kingdom of Judah on the slave coast? Meet Aaron Lopez, born Duarte Lopez. He was a Jewish Portuguese slave trader. Through his very commercial ventures, he became the wealthiest person in Newport, Rhode Island in British America in 1561 and 1762. Lopez expanded his trade beyond the North American coastline by 1757. He had major interests in the West Indian slave trade. He also sent ships to Europe and the Canary Islands between 1761 and 1774. As we established earlier, it was the Murano Jews who controlled the slave trade, which some were Portuguese and Dutch. It was written on their maps that the slave coast was actually the Judeans of Israel or Yehuda. So that would mean that they would have some info about the Sub-Saharan Africans, right? This is a quote from Stephen Jacobs, European Jewish historian, from his book, The Hebrew Heritage of Black Africa, fully documented. Black Americans are now in a position as never before in modern history to rediscover and reclaim, if they wish, a heritage which has profoundly influenced world history and mankind, the Hebrew heritage of black Africa. So since we've established, without dispute, that not only did the true Israelites flee into sub-Saharan Africa, but that the scripture also agrees 
that the dispersed of Israel are beyond the rivers of Cush. And from there were transported as slaves into every nation. Not for the first time, but actually the third time around. The first time and the second times were in the known world. The third time into the new world. And seeing that it was by the witness of two or three, that every word is established according to scripture. That would be right on the nose. Now, the last thing we need to consider is the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews location. Since 98% of the people who claim to be Jews are self-proclaimed Ashkenazi Jews. Well, who was Ashkenaz? Was he one of the sons of Jacob? No. Actually, he's the grandson of Japheth, the ancestor of Germany, a European country. So how can the ancestor of Germany be Hebrew when it's the Hebrews who descend from Shem? Well, one might say that they didn't descend from Ashkenaz, but rather they were just Jews who were living in the area of Ashkenaz. Well, then you have a bigger problem. If 98% of all the Jews in the world were in Germany or Russia, since 98% of the world's Jews are Ashkenazi, then how could any Jews be scattered anywhere else? Doesn't the Bible say they would go captive into every nation? Where are they? Also, if almost 100% of all the Jews in the world were in Germany, why would the Bible say they were in Cush, Egypt, and Assyria, and Arabia? Was there not one Jew in those areas? Also, if every Jew was in Germany or Russia, why does the Bible not even mention them places as places they were scattered to? Not in a single prophecy. Also, let's not leave out the 2% of so-called Sephardic Jews. Who are they? 2 Kings 17 verses 24 through 25. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kuhath and from Ava and from Hamath and from catch it Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and they dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them and slew some of them. Strong's H 56:16. Sepharvaim, meaning the two Sephiroth, Sepharjim or Sepharim. As you can see, that the Sephardic, who are the Sepharim, are not Hebrews. Yet, according to them, 100% of the world's Jews were in Spain and Germany. Why? Pretty simple. 98% of the world's Jews are Ashkenazi, were in Germany, and the rest, the 2%, are Sephardic. That makes 100%. I didn't realize that Spain and Germany is counted as every nation. Or that Spain and Germany is also called Egypt, Cush, Assyria, Babylon, and Ethiopia, for that matter. You almost have to live under a rock not to know of or hear about the Middle East conflict, aka okay? the Jewish people versus Palestine. In 1948, Israel gained the status of statehood, but at the cost of freedom of another. Ever since, the Palestinian people and the Israelis have been at perpetual war. As we have proven in parts 1 through 4, the Jewish people are in fact Ukrainians from an area formerly called Khazaria. As attested by their own Jewish historians, scholars and rabbis. The Palestinians on the other hand have a different story. Historians state that when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, that Rome allowed a small segment of Hebrews to remain. namely servants and farmers besides the ones captured and the ones who fled into Africa and Arabia these peoples would eventually incur some mixing with other groups who conquered Palestine in particular the Ottoman Turks to this day the groups of people who occupy Palestine is a combination of the descendants of Ottomans and the original Hebrews who are labeled as Afro-Palestinians The African presence is still visible in Israel today. There are thousands of African Palestinians who live in Israel with deep roots to the land, whose ancestors date back for centuries. I met with Ali Jaddah, tour guide, and the informal mayor of the African Palestinians in Old Jerusalem. I asked him about his life and relations between the Afro-Arabs and the Jews. Well, life for him, I think it's the hell. I'm one of those people who had experienced that. To be Palestinian, that's a big problem. But to be a black Palestinian, 
I'm quite convinced it will be there because uh, as a black Palestinian, I am uh, double oppressed. Double oppressed by the Israelis. In what way? In what way? I will explain. First of all, they first of all they oppress me as a Palestinian. You see. Uh, secondly, they oppress me because of the, my color. Whenever I go around in the Israeli side, they call me Kushi. Kushi means nigger. Kushi means nigger. So, in Israel, the land of God, people who are the brothers of the Arabs, two brothers, you are called nigger as I am called nigger in America? Uh, let's say on the surface, uh, this is what they say, that this is the land of God and uh, we are cousins and there should be total equality. But once you come to the practice, when you come on ground, you will find that there is a lot of discrimination and there is a real divorce, a real divorce uh, between what they say and what they exercise. Blacks and whites who watch the show say, so why stay? Why stay when you are called nigger every day? Why stay? when you were denied your rights? On the contrary, uh, they never, they, the more they humiliate me, the more they oppress me, the more I stick to my land. Because this is my land, I'm so rooted, we are deeply rooted as Africans, as Palestinian Africans in this land. And we know pretty well that our ancestors, I'm talking about thousands and thousands of years, we had been here in this country, but they were spread away, taken to Africa, from Africa to the United States. Our ancestors, I'm talking about thousands and thousands of years, we had been here in this country, but they were spread away, taken to Africa, from Africa to the United States, 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 from Africa to the United States. To the United States. I am Sar Madiel Ben Yehuda. Sar means minister. My title in the community, my role is minister, my portfolio is that of information. I'm charged to collect, to analyze, and then to disseminate information about the Hebrew Israelites here in uh, Israel, about our particular uh, history as a community and our history as a people uh, connecting back to this land. Uh, we consider Israel to be Northeast Africa. We are living here in the southern portion of Israel in what is known as the Southern Judean Mountains. And uh, of course, we have to make this clear that, that Israel uh, predates any uh, Palestinian uh, connections here to this land. When you look at the name of Palestine, it was the name that the Romans gave to the land formerly known as Judea. Now I didn't say Jewish or uh, Judaism, but Judea. So the Judeans were the people that actually lived in this portion of this land prior to the uh, it being named Palestine by the Romans. So this is what we consider to be Northeast Africa. We are sitting on the African tectonic plate. There are African species of birds and animals and, and plants that you'll find all throughout this region. Why I took you here is that I want to show you that the country called Israel is sitting on the African tectonic plate. Now, we're going to go over here and I'm going to show you where Israel sits on the African tectonic plate, which means that Israel is Northeast Africa. Now, when we look at this map, this is the, this is the Sinai, okay? This is the Red Sea. This is Egypt. This is the Sinai. This is Israel, all right? This is Saudi Arabia over here. Now, if you see this in Hebrew, it says Haluak Afrikani, the African plate. Here it is right here. Israel is sitting right here. Israel is sitting on the Haluak Afrikani, which means that Israel is North East Africa. I want to say I'm sorry that my English is not so good, but <laughs> I will try, you know, to explain or to to teach the people, the people that don't know that we are here in this land before uh, maybe uh, maybe more in uh, 2000 of year in this area uh, in Sinai Desert. It's uh, it's not far from here. It's near the Jordan Israeli border. 
there is our land, my land, my grandfather's land. So, uh, so before you know, before maybe before the, the state of Israel, the border of this Israel or Palestine is not in this in this border today. It's very near. Before it's El Arish, El Arish in Egypt today. There is the border of this the holy the holy land. This is the religion thing. So many people they don't know that uh, the black people here in this land it's it's not uh, for the last hundred years something like this is more than uh, a thousand of years. Africa. He's from Africa. Ah, Saba. And we have Esther Dorot. Esther Dorot. Ten generations here. Israel, it was Palestine, it was the Turkish, the Turkish, the Turkish, the Turkish, the Turkish, the Turkish, the Palestinian, before the Turkish Empire, his people was here. The original people here, it was black, I know about the hoster of Beni Hilal, I know about the Zir Salem history, everybody knows this. Uh, most of the, the Bedouin here, most of them they come from the Arab Gulf. Uh, they know, they, they can know they, they're not original here. They know that we are the original uh, people here in this land. The Israeli author Shlomo Sand in his book The Invention of the Jewish People, between the pages of 184, 188, he goes into great depth talking about the early Zionist thinkers like Baird Vodokov and even David Ben-Gurion. Uh, he quotes David Ben-Gurion and Ben Svi, Yitzhak Ben Svi, talking about the fact that the early Judean peasants were actually the foundation of what, the, uh, what they encountered when they came into this land. This is a book they wrote 30 years prior to the Declaration of Israel's Independence and they recognized that the Fellahim, this peasant class, were actually those that had remained here, that had converted perhaps to Islam, that converted perhaps to Christianity, depending on the ruling class, depending on the, the armies at the time that held Jerusalem and held this particular region. They simply, in their love for the land and the fact that these armies needed to be fed, they became the peasant class, the agrarian, uh, agronomists, the agriculturalists who continue to raise their crops and to take care of their families in a desire to stay on this land. See, sometimes you just have to hear it from the horse's mouth. As you see, the Afro-Palestinians attest that their people were took down to Africa and sold to America, confirming everything that we've discussed. So when these peoples these blacks, these Hebrews, they were taken from the west coast of Africa and shipped to the four corners of the earth. When they landed in areas such as North America, the question to ask is, were there any evidences, were there any connections that they brought with them into the Americas that connected them with the Hebrews of West Africa? Well, if you look a little harder, you might find some things. Starting with the actual names that the slaves had before they came to the Americas. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. According to this scripture, Israel would not know their master, nor his master's crib. This has reference to do with them not knowing who they are, or who their father is. The crib in Hebrew means a manger or a stall. In the case of the Hebrew Israelites, it's Israel. The so-called Jews, this isn't the case for them. They believe that they're the Jews. It's us that don't believe that we are the true people, the true Hebrews of the Bible. It's us that do not know our father's real name they are clueless and have completely lost their heritage and thou even thyself shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not 
for ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Think about it. As soon as the slaves were sold, the masters changed their names, stopped them from speaking their native language, forbid them from learning how to read. This was all done to strip them of their heritage. Your name is Toby. Isn't this the same thing name. that happened to the Israelites in the scriptures? In the book of Daniel, the children of Israel was taken into captivity or slavery in Babylon under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. The children known as Daniel, Hananiah, Michael, and Azariah, names were all changed to what? Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? <laughs> that wasn't their real names. They changed their names. Why did they change their names? Because their names praised the Most High. Their names gave praise to the Most High. And they said, no. Went down to the river Jordan, where John baptized three. When I woke the devil in hell, says Johnny baptized me. I say, roll, Jordan, roll, Yo. roll, now roll, Jordan, yes. roll. My soul arises, ever Lord, for the year of Jordan, roll. Well, some say John was a Baptist. Some say John was a Jew. But I say John was a preacher because my Bible says so too. I say, roll, Judah, roll. Roll, Judah, roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year of Judah, roll. Hallelujah, roll, Judah, roll. Roll, Jordan, roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year of Jordan, roll. Hallelujah. Roll, Jordan, roll. Roll, Jordan, roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year of Jordan, roll. Everybody say roll, Jordan, roll. Roll, Jordan, roll. Roll, Jordan, roll. Roll, Jordan, roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan rose. Hey, Gaia. Roll, Jordan, roll. Roll, Jordan, roll. roll, Jordan, roll. My soul arise in heaven, Lord, for the year when Jordan rose. Roll, Jordan, roll. 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 Roll, you ever wonder why, after those names were changed from Hebrew names to English names, why wasn't the slaves allowed to speak their language or write their language but forced to write English and speak English? Well, when you look into the actual language that they wrote and spoke it, you will see why these things had to be covered up. This is First African Baptist Church, the oldest black church in North America. The building built by slaves. The gentleman that laid the first brick laid the last. The balcony hold pews that actually were built by slaves. They have the oldest information in this building. That information is written in cursive Hebrew writing. That information is written in cursive Hebrew writing. That information is written in cursive Hebrew writing. Written in cursive Hebrew writing. Hebrew writing. Hebrew writing. Hebrew writing.
The slaves founded First African Baptists in 1777, writing cursive Hebrew on the pews, proving first of all, not only could they read and write, but the language that they wrote was Hebrew. So it was not that the blacks could not read or write, but that they could not read or write English. Sound familiar? Deuteronomy 28, verse 49. And the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as that eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Now once you put the facts together, that not only did they read and write Hebrew, but many had Hebrew names, were circumcised on the eighth day, practiced Levitical laws of clean and unclean, and had a priesthood among them that they considered to be living sacrifices, you start to get the picture. Even more interesting is the fact that slaves were writing Hebrew in 1777, when modern Hebrew, which is spoken by the Ashkenazi Jews, did not exist until 1881. Facts. In parts 1-4 through four of this documentary, we address the Deuteronomy 28 curses, the most controversial of which, for those who would try to deny this truth, is the 68th verse. Deuteronomy 28 and 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spake unto thee, and thou shalt see it no more again. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall redeem you. We've already established how Egyptos, or Mitzrayim, means bondage, and how the curse states not that they will return to the landmass of Egypt, but rather go into bondage or spiritual Egypt into all nations. Deuteronomy 28, verse 25. And the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thy enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. We've also addressed how America is a spiritual Egypt, being that Egypt was their most severe slavery until 70 AD, harder than the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities. But America has been the most severe slavery of any people since Egypt or any other period, and also the longest captivity, seeing that the Hebrews were not oppressed or enslaved in Egypt until around the time of the birth of Moses. Israelites in Egypt. In Exodus 12:40, it says, Now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. And so because of this, movies like the Ten Commandments will say things like this. That's a hard dance you do, old man. We've been dancing it for 400 years. 400 years we have waited. 400 years in bondage, and today he won't move. After 400 years of slavery experts on the topic will say things like this. The Israelites were there 430 years. We have the record in the Bible that tells about the Israelites going into Egypt and living there for 430 years. But if you do the math, you'll find that this is not mathematically possible. You see, Moses was 80 years old when they left Egypt. His father Amram lived to 137. His father Kohath lived to 133. And Kohath was one of the 66 persons who went with Jacob down into Egypt. Now let's just stretch this out as much as we possibly can. Let's assume that Kohath was a newborn baby when he arrived in Egypt. Let's assume that Amram was born the year that his father died, and let's assume that Moses was born the year that his father died. 
So take 133 plus 137 plus 80, and that equals 350, which means that the amount of time the Israelites were in Egypt could have been no longer than 350 years maximum. Now, more than likely, Kohath was probably not a newborn baby when he arrived in Egypt. More than likely, Moses was not born the year that his father died. And more than likely, Amram was not born the year that his father died. Which means that the amount of time the Israelites were in Egypt would have been significantly less than 350 years. So why does Exodus 1240 say the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years when this is not mathematically possible? The key is found in one of Paul's letters. In Galatians 3, 16 and 17, Paul says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ. Basically, Paul is saying that from the time that Abraham received the promise to the time that Moses received the law, there was 430 years. Well, Abraham received the promise when he entered Canaan when he was 75 years old. Then, 25 years later, when Abraham was 100 years old, that's when Isaac was born. Then, 60 years later, when Isaac was 60 years old, that's when Jacob was born. Then, 130 years later, when Jacob was 130 years old, that's when all of Israel arrived in Egypt. So take 25 plus 60 plus 130, and that equals 215, which means that there was 215 years from the time that Abraham entered Canaan to the time that all of Israel arrived in Egypt. Now, Moses received the law the same time that they left Egypt, because remember, the Israelites were living in Goshen, and then Moses led them out of Goshen, brought them through the wilderness, and brought them to the sea. And then God split the waters of the sea in half and brought them into Midian, which is in Arabia, then brought them to Mount Sinai, which is where Moses received the law. And so Moses received the law the same time they left Egypt. So Paul is saying that there was 430 years from this point to this point, and according to the Old Testament, there's 215 years from this point to this point. So take 430 years and then subtract 215 years, and that equals 215, which means that the amount of time that the Israelites were in Egypt was 215 years. 215 in Egypt, 215 in Canaan, 430 total. Now that is mathematically possible, because 215 is significantly less than 350. And that's exactly what the Greek Septuagint says in Exodus 1240. It says, And the sojourning of the children of Israel while they sojourn in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan was 430 years. The Samaritan Pentateuch says the same thing. It says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel and of their fathers, which they had dwelt in the land of Canaan and in Egypt, was 430 years. Flavius Josephus says they left Egypt 430 years after our forefather Abraham came into Canaan, but 215 years only after Jacob removed into Egypt. Flavius Josephus is saying the exact same thing. He's saying they left Egypt 430 years since our forefather Abraham came into Canaan, but 215 years only since Jacob removed into Egypt. Flavius Josephus is saying the exact same thing. So why do modern translations say that the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years when this is not mathematically possible? The reason why is because modern translations like the New King James, the NIV, the NASB, these are all translated from the Hebrew Masoretic Text. But the Hebrew Masoretic Text is not the original Hebrew text. The copy of the Masoretic Text that most modern translations are translated from is called the Leningrad Codex, which was copied in the 11th century AD. But the Greek Septuagint was translated more than a thousand years before that in 250 BC, which means that the Greek Septuagint would not have been translated from the Hebrew Masoretic, but rather it would have been translated from a much older copy of the Hebrew that's no longer around today. The Samaritan Pentateuch also predates the Masoretic text and would also have been translated from a much older copy of the Hebrew. Flavius Josephus was a first century Jewish historian. He lived long before the Masoretic text was copied. And Josephus had access to ancient Hebrew texts that have since been lost or destroyed. Paul the Apostle lived long before the Masoretic text was copied, and Paul knew Hebrew. In Acts 26, when Paul talks about his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he says that Jesus spoke to him in the Hebrew language, and Paul understood him. Paul knew Hebrew, and so Paul would also have studied from a much older copy of the Hebrew. And what Paul says in Galatians 3, 16 and 17 is consistent with the Greek Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and the writings of Flavius Josephus. Now the Bible says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Well, we've got more than two or three witnesses here. We've got four witnesses, all bearing witness that the original Hebrew text said that the Israelites will be in Egypt and Canaan for 430 years. But more than a thousand years later, when the Hebrew Masoretic text was copied, the phrase and Canaan was dropped out of the text. 
and all of our Bibles are translated from this corrupted copy of the Hebrew. The New King James, the Old King James, the NIV, the NASB, the ESV. If you go to BibleGateway.com, you'll find there's 50 English translations of the Bible on this website. And every single one of them say that the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years, which is incorrect and mathematically impossible. Every single one of these translations are inconsistent with the original Hebrew because they're all translated from the Hebrew Masoretic, and according to these four witnesses, the Masoretic text copied it incorrectly. As a matter of fact, these ages of Moses and his father and grandfather are recorded in the Masoretic text, and yet they only add up to 350 years maximum. So in that sense, there's even a fifth witness. The Masoretic bears witness against itself. And so the amount of time the Israelites were in Egypt was only 215 years. But the years of slavery was even less than that, because the Israelites did not become slaves until after Joseph and all that generation died, and then a new king arose who did not know Joseph. Well, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered Pharaoh's service, and shortly after there were seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. So it would appear that after the seven years of abundance, Joseph would have been 37 years old. Then two years into the famine when he was 39, that's when all of Israel arrived in Egypt. So based on the information given, it appears as if Joseph was 39 years old at the beginning of that 215 years. Then Joseph died at 110, so take 110 and subtract 39 and that equals 71, which means that for 71 years the Israelites were in Egypt under Joseph's rule and they were not slaves during those 71 years. So take the 215 years that the Israelites were in Egypt, subtract the 71 years that Joseph was in power and that equals 144, which means that the Israelites were not slaves for any longer than 144 years maximum. Now Moses was 80 years old when they left Egypt, and they were already in slavery when Moses was born, which means that they could not have been slaves for any less than 80 years minimum. So take the 215 years that the Israelites were in Egypt, subtract the 71 years that Joseph was in power, subtract the 80 years of Moses' life, and that equals 64, which means that there were 64 years in between Joseph's death and Moses' birth. The Israelites became slaves sometime after Joseph died and sometime before Moses was born, sometime within that 64-year time period. Now let's just assume that the Israelites became slaves at exactly the midpoint in between Joseph's death and Moses' birth. That would be 32 years after Joseph died and 32 years before Moses was born. If this is the case, then that would mean that the Israelites were slaves for 112 years. And so the amount of time the Israelites were in slavery was probably about 112 years or so. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but definitely no more than a maximum of 144 and definitely no less than 80 years minimum. Whatever the case, the Israelites were definitely not slaves for nearly as long as the movies make it sound when they say 400 years in bondage and today he won't move. The Israelites were not slaves for 400 years. They were only slaves for about 112 years or so, plus or minus 32 years. You see, when you take the prophecy in Genesis and you match that up with the timeline in Exodus, then you're able to understand how these puzzle pieces fit together. But the main thing that causes people to misinterpret this prophecy in Genesis is the Hebrew Masoretic text has dropped the phrase and Canaan out of the text. This is the main thing that causes people to believe that the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years. But the truth is, they were in Egypt for only half that time, for 215 years. According to the documentary Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus, the Israelites' arrival in Egypt was around 1665 BC, and the Exodus took place at about 1450 BC. This means that the Israelites were in Egypt for 215 years. This is the only thing that the archaeological evidence supports. The evidence does not support 430 years in Egypt. This is the reason why it's important to understand biblical history correctly first in order to correctly understand how it correlates with Egyptian history and archaeology. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Lord, you never gave up. Lord, you never gave up on us. You never gave up. Lord, you were always there. And you're here right now, still loving me. All the while, you always care, yeah. And I can't thank you enough for always being there. Bring me through still waters and speak peace to the waves. Restore 
but souls with life and left death in the grave. Lead me in your righteousness and I will follow in your ways. So if the Hebrews were only slaves in Egypt for 112 years and only in exile in Babylon for 70 years, when was this prophecy in scripture fulfilled? Genesis 15 verses 13 through 14. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that thy seed should be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. See, Christ spoke of another captivity that will take place after 70 AD. That's after Egypt, after Babylon, after Assyria, and after Greece and Rome. Luke 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Combine that with all the Egyptian symbolism and imagery of America. Everything to the great seal and the dollar, to the Washington Monument and the flag. Red, white, and blue were the colors of the northern and southern kingdoms of Egypt. Freemasonry, which was the religion of the founding fathers. How many you say? Mm, something to the tune of 44 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. So how is this relevant? Freemasonry is an Egyptian religion. Its origins come from the pyramid text. Then there's this little fact about how, just like Egypt, lots of the monuments and the cities of the leaders were built by slaves living under the worst possible conditions. These similarities were not lost on certain historians. Specifically, Pulitzer Prize nominated author George M. Fredrickson. George M. Fredrickson was an American Edgar E. Robinson professor of history at Stanford University from 1984 until the time of his retirement in 2002. In Fredrickson's book, The Black Image in the White Mind, on page 74 through 75 wrote that in the 1840s, Dr. Samuel Morton, an American physician who collected hundreds of human skulls from around the world in an attempt to classify them into races, teamed with Egyptologist George R. Gildon, who in turn provided mummy heads and information about the racial significance of Egyptian tomb inscriptions. Morton was a white supremacist whose goal was to prove that the Egyptians were not of Negro origin but of Caucasian stock, which failed. But when they compared the Negro skulls to the skulls of the mummies and others found in ancient Egypt, they found something very interesting. In their book Crania Egyptica, they documented that the cranial evidence showed that the Egyptians were not Negroes. The Negro heads were longer than the Egyptian heads. But they found that the principal features were similar. In other words, the same thick lips and broad noses. But when looking at the skeletal structure, they found that the Negro and the Egyptian were actually two totally different people. Confirming the fact that abolitionists and colonists had maintained that in fact blacks had been relegated to the same servitude position in ancient Egypt as in modern America. But what Dr. Morton did discover is that Negroes that were serving slavery in America served the same position and servitude in ancient Egypt when he matched the other skulls and the other remains in Egypt. They said these were exact matches. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way of I spoke unto thee, and thou shalt see it no more again and ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women and no man shall redeem you. As we have concluded in this video, historically, archaeologically, and the Bible, all point to the Negro as the exiled tribe of Judah, as even confirmed by the Ashkenazis themselves. We are rebirth of a nation, 
would like to thank TOTO and Sadat the Guide MC for the factual contributions to our video. Shalom and Shalom. You Israelites, you black people in this country, what do you say about them? You call them animals? I call them inferior. I call you slaves. We turn you into slaves. And when we didn't need them anymore, we kick you out of Israel. I mean, out of Egypt, out of Africa. We sold you to America. And that's where we want you to stay. We want you to stay.